Welcome to this episode of Art with Mrs. Cap. This episode, we're going to be looking at the art of ancient Greece. So let's go ahead and explore this wonderful world of art. Key works that we're going to look at in this lesson are the geometric crater vase. This is from the geometric period of Greek art. This is a time period from 1000 to 700 BC. Then we're going to look at the Doric and Ionic orders. This is from the Archaic period of Greek art. And this is from 700 to about 480 BC. And then we're going to look at the Parthenon. This is part of classical Greek art. And this is from, the, from 480 to 300 BC, roughly that time period. And then we're going to look at Nike or Nike of Samothrace. This is Hellenistic, and this is from 300 to 100 BC. That's that time period for Hellenistic Greek art. All right, so main points, depictions of human figures are emphasized and changed throughout the various stylistic time periods as a reflection of the philosophies of the time. So unlike ancient Egyptian art, which basically we learned about, it's completely unchanged for 3,000 years. Greek art changes and evolves as Greeks lean towards the philosophy of humanism, particularly during the classical period. The Greek desire for perfection is reflected in the art and architecture. Realistic depictions dominate Hellenistic Greek sculpture whereas idealism dominates in the classical Greek works. All right, so the theology of the ancient Greeks. Some gods were specifically associated with certain cities. Athena was associated with the city of Athens, Apollo with Delphi, Zeus with Olympia, and Aphrodite with Corinth. Other deities were associated with nations outside of Greece. Poseidon was associated with Ethiopia and Troy. So there's a lot of theology um, and mythology and so forth that the ancient Greeks were known for. So theology, the ancient Greeks believed that there were many gods and goddesses, which is known as polytheism. Poly means many. Theism is the belief in um, theism is just a belief in God or gods. Um, there was a hierarchy of deities with Zeus as the king of gods. So he was like the big, the big guy. Um, some deities had dominions over certain aspects of nature. For instance, Zeus was the sky god and he's often represented this way, usually holding like a bolt of lightning. And he's sending thunder and lightning. Poseidon ruled over the sea and earthquakes. And he's often represented with a trident. You can kind of see a little bit of a nod to that with King Triton in The Little Mermaid. Um, he's kind of like a representation of the Greek mythology about Poseidon. Um, Hades projected his remarkable power throughout the realms of death and the underworld. And Helios controlled the sun. Other deities ruled over an abstract concept. For instance, Aphrodite controlled love. All right, so religion, mythology. Greek religion had an extensive mythology. It consisted largely of stories of the gods and how they affected humans on earth. We get a lot of really cool entertainment that's based on these um, myths and legends and so forth. So myths often revolve around heroes and their actions such as Hercules and his 12 labors, Odysseus and his voyage home, it's known as the Odyssey, Jason and the quest for the golden fleece. So there's a lot of really cool fun stories in the mythology. Many of the myths revolve around the Trojan War between Greece and Troy. For instance, the epic poem, The Iliad, by Homer is based on the war. All right, so ceremonies within religion. Greek ceremonies and rituals were mainly performed at altars. These typically were devoted to one or a few gods and contained a statue of the particular deity upon it. Votive deposits would be left at the altar, such as food, drinks, um, as well as precious objects. Sometimes animal sacrifice would be performed here. 
All right, so now looking at periods in ancient Greek art, now that we have a little bit of a brief understanding of the culture. So geometric, that's from 1000 to 700 BC. We're gonna look at the crater vase. And then archaic, that's 700 to 480 BC. We're gonna look at the Doric and Ionic orders. And then classical is 480 to 300 BC. We're gonna look at the Parthenon. Um, probably one of the most famous works of architecture in the world. And then Hellenistic um, is 300 BC to roughly 100, um, you know, AD, CE. And we're going to look at Nike of Samothrace, also known uh, as Winged Victory. All right, so geometric, 1000 to 700 BC, crater vases. It's um, pottery that's ornamented with geometric banding and friezes of simplified animals or humans. Vase paintings told stories about gods and heroes of Greek myths. Craters were placed in the center of the room. They were quite large, so they were not easily portable when filled. All right, so we have here some examples of crater vases from the geometric period of Greek art. And you can see how there's these bands that wrap around. Some of them are frieze patterns and geometric patterns. Some of them are, um, you know, telling a story or something like that. I've seen some of these in different exhibits. I went to an Aphrodite exhibit um, one year and all the crater vases they had there were representative of um, Aphrodite in some way or another. And then, of course, I've been to several museums that have amazing Greek art collections, and they also have had these on display. So these vases really, um, you know, have that geometric quality to them, but they also tell a story, whether it's a myth and a legend or part of Greek history. So the archaic period is typically, in history and archaeology, the earliest phases of a culture. However, the term is most frequently used by art historians to denote the period of artistic development in Greece from about 650 to 480 BC, the date of the Persian sack of Athens. Greek art became less rigidly stylized and more naturalistic. Paintings on vases evolved from geometric, like we see in the geometric period, geometric designs to representations of human figures often illustrating epic tales. In sculpture, faces were animated with the characteristic archaic smile, and bodies were rendered with growing attention to human proportion and anatomy. The development of the Doric and Ionic orders for architecture in the archaic period also reflected a growing concern with harmonious architectural proportions. All right, so the Doric and Ionic orders, these are examples, and these probably look familiar to you because there are three main orders used from the ancient world. We're talking about two of them because they come from Greece. The third one actually comes from the Roman Empire. Um, but we see this Doric order and the Ionic order. So the Doric's the oldest of the two, and it's very simplified. And then Ionic is where you get those scrolls up. That's one of the easiest ways to identify it. You get those kind of scrolls up in the top of the um, column in that column capital, which you actually see right above me. Um, so these are just, you know, examples of those orders. This is one of the greatest achievements of the archaic time. And you see all of these um, components used throughout the architecture in ancient Greece, as well as during the Roman Empire and into today. Um, the third style that is most popular is the Corinthian style. And we'll look at that when we look at ancient um, Rome and the Roman Empire. All right, classical. Classical is from 480 to 300 BC. There's the Parthenon temple and sculptures that we're gonna look at. A perfect example of the desire for perfection and incorporation of the mathematical principles of classical architecture. Sculptures represented the perfection of the human form. Bodies were not stiff. They looked fully alive and movable. Parthenon was a symbol of ancient Greece and of Athenian democracy, and it's one of the world's greatest cultural monuments. 
All right, so here's some examples of the classical. I have some um, historical art artist renderings on the side that I'm on that you can look at there. These are where archaeologists, art historians, and so forth pull together their understanding and the research to help reconstruct what the Parthenon looked like before it fell into um, the state that it is in today. The ones on the other side are actually what it looks like today. Okay, so you can kind of see there. The roof has been blown off um, during the Ottoman Empire time period. Um, during that time period, the, so this was actually recent history in the past few hundred years, they used the Parthenon as a like munitions storage for um, weapons and you know all this kind of stuff and apparently like a cannonball or something landed in it and it made everything inside explode when that happened it like blew the whole roof off so what's unfortunate is the parthenon was still standing until somewhat recent history and then because of a war or whatever it um was damaged significantly but what's amazing is that it's this old and it is still standing today, even if it has been damaged some. All right, Hellenistic. This is from 300 BC to 100 AD. That's that time period there. Um, so Nike of Samothrace is a marble sculpture of the Greek goddess Nike, where we get Nike. Um, Think about it like your shoes or whatever. It's, you know, it's Nike, but it's actually Nike. So the Nike of Samothrace was discovered in 1863. It's estimated to have been created around 190 BC. It was created to not only honor the goddess Nike, but to honor a sea battle. It conveys a sense of action and triumph as well as portraying artful flowing drapery we're going to see that in a minute through its features which the greek considered ideal beauty and here is nike of samothrace this work of art um, today is in the louvre museum i've had the privilege of seeing it a couple of times and it's absolutely breathtaking what's kind of um interesting is you go right by right by this on your way to see um the Mona Lisa. And so many people rush by it, think it, because it's like in a staircase, kind of off by itself. It's elevated above everything, um, which kind of gives you a clue that it has some importance. But um, people just walk past it, sometimes not even realizing what they're looking at. And it's just such an amazing work of art. This is carved out of marble. Just to give you an idea of how big it is, um, if you look like right beside me, these are stairs. Okay, so these are stairs that you walk up. And if you think about the normal size of a stair, you can kind of figure out about how tall a person would be. They wouldn't, you know, come above that like base. So that tells you how large this is. But if you look at it, the carving is phenomenal. You can even see like Nikkei's belly button. Like it looks like it is, um, you know, fabric that's draped over her that's kind of semi translucent, and you really get this sense of movement like it is just the wind is wrapping it around her, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it is just phenomenal. Obviously, this has been damaged, you know, we're missing parts of her, but it's just absolutely beautiful how they were able to take marble and almost bring it to life. And that's kind of the, the mark of the Hellenistic period of art is that sense of life that was breathed into cold marble. So um, a few looks at what she originally looked like, and you can kind of see here some different angles. You see the wings kind of stretching out off of her back. Um, and you see an artist rendering there that kind of shows what she probably looked like before she was damaged and would, still would have had her head and her arms. <laughs> um, but those are just, you know, some some ways you can kind of see the difference and um, 
style from all the previous styles of Greek art. So this is just a wonderful example of Greek achievement during the Hellenistic period, but it's kind of that last period of ancient Greek art. Um, it kind of runs concurrently with the rise of the Roman Empire um, as it becomes more powerful and so forth. So they kind of overlap at this time. But um, a lot of this art influences Roman art as well as the classical Greek um, period. So I hope you enjoyed this little discussion on Greek art history, um, particularly of ancient Greece. And I hope you will join me next time on Art with Mrs. Cap as we explore the world of art history. I'll see you next time. Bye.